You are listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Nicholas Vieta. And my name is Alice Koenig. And we co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. Our guest today is Dr. Mike Martin, a former British Army officer and now an author and expert on many different aspects of conflict. As a fluent Pashto speaker, Mike was deployed to Afghanistan multiple times, becoming an expert on local culture and history. What he learned during those deployments led him to design and set up a cultural advisors program for the British military, and we're going to ask him a bit about that in a minute. Mike's time in Afghanistan also prompted him to dive deeper into the many decades of conflict which had played out in the region long before the US-led invasion in 2001. And he ended up doing a PhD at King's London, excavating that history while still serving in the army and advising actually very senior commanders on operations in Helmand. He ended up publishing that PhD as a book entitled An Intimate War, And that actually brought him into conflict with the army. Again, something we're going to ask him about as we get chatting. And then after leaving the army, Mike has worked for risk management companies and NGOs, advising on how to navigate cross-cultural interactions when working across borders and different cultural communities. And he has written some more books, for example, Crossing the Congo, the tale of an amazing journey he took across the Congo Basin with two friends and a 25-year-old Land Rover in 2013, and Why We Fight, a study of what drives humans to conflict despite the fact that war does not make good sense. So Mike's arguments in that book are really interesting for our study of our habits of visualizing war. One of the things that he stresses is that the way we describe war doesn't match the lived experience of it. So we're gonna be asking him to explain that a bit more. And we're also gonna explore what his time in Afghanistan taught him about the gaps between narrative and reality in that particular conflict zone. So Mike, there's a lot we want to talk to you about today, Um, but let's start by welcoming you to the Visualising War podcast. (laughs) Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for the introduction, wow. So as you know, our project is particularly interested in narratives, um, how war stories work and also what war stories do to us. So we're going to be trying to pick your brains on that quite a bit. But I wonder if we can start actually by going back to your kind of formative experiences, your childhood, your growing up. Can you remember Mm. the kinds of stories that influenced you or shaped you or or shaped how you Mm. ended up imagining war? Yeah. Yeah. And I think as well, why I, why I went to war. I mean, I think I always knew I was going to be a soldier, not for my whole life, but I was definitely going to soldier at some point in my life. So I used to read books like King Solomon's Minds and Beaugest and you know like Wilfred Fessager and for those of you who don't haven't heard of those authors those are either kind of books of independent explorers who are making big journeys and along the way encountering people you know hitherto unknown to that particular community and then having to negotiate or or fight their way through or they are sort of you know Beaugest is a kind of a, a tale of French colonial northwest Africa where they are having to, you know, work with tribes and play tribes off against each other. And I, so I sort of imagined that warfare was this incredibly subtle game where violence was blended with politics and politics with a small P, you know, so you meet a a local leader and then there's a, effectively a game of chess where you're trying to both trying to achieve what you want and violence will be you know maybe one form of communication that you're both using to achieve whatever your aims are and I sort of I think naively I imagine that was what it would be like when I went to Afghanistan with the British army and of course when I got there I was kind of horrified at how unsubtle the game that we were playing uh, and you know we being the co you know the Americans and the Australians and the Dutch and the you know the sort of NATO coalition and I I imagined it would be like this game of chess but it was it was more simplistic than a game of uh, checkers I guess 
So essentially, Mike, you're, you're saying that there was quite a big gap between what you had read about in those stories and what you imagined and what you saw on the ground, so to speak. Can you tell us a bit more about this, uh, this gap between the lived experience of war and, and our habits of thinking about war and maybe even those kind of uh, romantic stories or these war as an adventure story that came out a little bit in what you were saying about the books that, that you were reading? Mm. I think there's a, like, a lot of layers in your question. So the, the, the first layer is the books that I was reading written by these authors in the 1800s and early 1900s, were they actually describing the war as it was? You know, this is a kind of question for all historians or, or were they describing a one-sided or a romantic view of it? Um, I certainly think that they had a better idea than we did. You know, most of the time they spoke the language and they maybe spent 20 years of their career there rather than you know, six months with the standard tour in Afghanistan. So I guess that's the first thing was what I was reading as a young child and being inspired by or elements of it, the adventurous elements of it inspired me. Was that was that a true depiction of what went on? Don't know. But then I then went to Afghanistan and that kind of model of warfare, if you like, let's call it pragmatic, influenced by local concerns, I think dealing less in absolutes, dealing more in shades of grey, say, I felt fitted what I saw in front of me much better than the black and white official narrative or depiction that, I mean, I think we're all aware of it, aren't we? You know, when we hear about Afghanistan or Iraq or Somalia or the war on terror or there's a there's a very polarising black white narrative, you know, the kind of official story. So in Afghanistan, that was that there was a legitimate government that was fighting an insurgency, the a Taliban insurgency, and the Western countries were supporting that legitimate government against this Taliban insurgency. And the government was good. OK, it was a bit corrupt, but it was trying really hard. And the Taliban insurgency was really bad and, you know, it was against girls' education and all this kind of stuff against democracy. So it's very you only had two options whose side you know if, if it goes right back to george bush's or donald Rumsfeld, whoever it was in 2002 you said you're either with us or against us that set up the polarizing narrative for the war on terror and i think all of the subsidiary wars that that f conflicts that flew out of that overarching rubric and it was it's a terrible terrible narrative to try and understand something so complex like there's not even one war in Afghanistan, definitely not. We'll talk about this more if you like. There's not one war in Helmand, which is one province of Afghanistan. There's not one war in Nadali, which is one district of Helmand. There are thousands of micro conflicts that are about the different things from water to land to, to, you know, a feud because my grandfather killed your grandfather to, you know, drugs, barons to saving face to revenge that you know everything is going on and to fit a and to then aggregate all of those thousands of conflicts not just in helm but in yemen somalia iraq etc to that overarching black white narrative it's just total nonsense so that was the main thing when you know when i got to afghanistan that was the overarching description of war and not just the politicians but also that's how journalists described it that's how the man in the pub spoke about it and shockingly when i got there that was how we were prosecuting it i guess we drunk our own kool-aid and believed it and so that was the framework through which all analysis and action flowed and what I saw in front of me was something much, much, much more complicated, much more subtle, much more shades of grey, much more like, I guess, the books I read when I was younger uh, with subtleties. I guess I'll conclude by linking all that together. Did I go to Afghanistan with that idea in my head because of those books I'd read and the self-image I had when I was younger? And was that the war that I found? Because that was my truth. That's that's a really interesting way of looking at it. I, I think if we can carry on kind of exploring your experiences in Afghanistan a little bit more, you yeah. served as a mm -hmm. political officer. So yeah. can you tell our listeners a little bit what that involved, um, what yeah. you did in that role? Mm. I was, you said in your introduction, I was a fluent um, Pushti speaker, uh, which I, uh, the army taught me, basically I went on an 18 month course and then spent a couple of years in Afghanistan. 
Um, and so my job, very simply in one line, was to build relationships with important Helmandis, come back to who they are in a minute, and use those relationships to either understand what's going on in Helmandi society or to influence them. So it's a kind of a two-way communication role. We understand them and hopefully they understand us a little bit better, actually. Who are the important Helmandis? Well, you know, you can sort of imagine if you were in... I don't know, St Andrews, uh, you know, you're in Edinburgh or whatever, uh, and you know, the importance you'd probably go and some people in Hollywood and the local mayor and you know, lots of the important maybe the leaders of the local businesses that you, you can imagine a sort of scenario where those would be the people you're speaking to. Of course, in someone like Helmand, which is just to give you, a, you know, just to situate your um, listeners. It, when I first went there, it was 90% illiterate. If you're a woman, that went up to 99.5% illiterate. It predominantly without services, uh, the districts of any sort. And most of them at that point had been in war for 30 years. So war between different tribes and whatever. So it's basically a medieval society, but with the addition of uh, mobile phones, Kalashnikovs and high explosive. It's a toxic brew. And so the important people in that society or societies like that are people with guns, right? So this is everyone from landowners, pretty important, um, lots of militia commanders, drugs, sort of leaders of drugs gangs or people who do the security for the drugs uh, trade, uh, obviously Taliban commanders, such as they were, you know, various people who were sort of in label terms on the government side. So, you know, police commanders and then, you know, various other, you know, assorted rascals and scoundrels and they were incredibly good politicians i mean it was a real for me it was just a master class because in that kind of environment so you know if i'm talking to someone who's 40 at that point so three quarters of their life have been spent in war and so if they're still alive at age 40 or 50 or whatever if they're 50 then three-fifths of their lives are spent in war but all of their adult lives right and so if they're still alive at that age, they're, they're basically very good politicians because it, it, if they're not good politicians, they would have been killed at some point by someone because they will have misjudged something. And, you know, and I mean the raw version of politics here. I mean, being able to walk into a room and read what everyone's thinking and then negotiate in a way that achieves the outcome for your tribe or your village. And and so they were just absolutely unbelievable politicians with a small P. Of course, in, you know, in the UK, we have lots of failed politicians. Many of them get booted up to the House of Lords or certainly given a directorship. I mean, I'm sitting, you, you know, you're smiling, but I, I, <laughs> that, that's true. They'll go on and get consultancy jobs or directorships. There's not there's not that higher price for failure in politics, um, whereas the selection mm -hmm. pressure in home any politics is very sharp. So I was kind of. I mean, it's the best job I think I'll ever have. You know, they wanted to speak to me because they knew I was an advisor to the senior British commander there. And I had influence on my side. So they wanted to speak to me and I had some limited influence. I could certainly communicate things uh, on the Afghan side. So the Brits listened to me, even though I think quite a lot of British officers saw me as incredibly annoying because I was allowed, I think, by the senior command to be a constructive critic. And that effectively meant going around and saying, guys, this narrative's total bollocks. <laughs> this idea we've got of the war is total rubbish. And I think a lot of people were annoyed by this random TA captain wearing jeans and a T-shirt telling people that the whole war was rubbish. As long as the senior command were going to support me doing that, I carried on doing it. And kudos to them, you know, for setting up that scenario where I could do that because I guess they saw that I was bringing that, that was bringing value. So it was just a fantastic job. Absolutely fascinating. How do you see the, the outcome of the strategy of trying this kind of cultural understanding, which obviously to us makes immediately sense. Um, I'm just wondering in, in the kind of the chaos that you were describing and the kind of the mm. complexity of the situation that we were talking about, how well do you think this work would 500 more mm. like you have been necessary mm. to kind of turn yeah. this thing around? Yeah, look, we had up to we probably had about 15 at the peak. I was the first one and then it grew out of that. And then eventually we sort of built up a cadre of people doing it. Um, in short, it didn't work. Um, and, and the reason it didn't work was because our policy, the British government's policy, was set in London. 
or it was set in agreement with Washington, you know, or the other NATO alliance members. So that policy was set in in our capitals and then in Afghanistan, we're meant to deliver it. And of course, you know, many of your listeners, I hope, are sort of students of war and they will know that strategy is... You know, if you read like Alan Brooke's diaries in the Second World War, so Alan Brooke was the, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, who was Churchill's senior military advisor. And, and that book is a masterclass in how to do strategy. And actually his statue is outside the Ministry of Defence in London and underneath it just says master of strategy. And he effectively, that process of strategy formation went something like this. Um, Churchill would come along and go, he's a politician, right? It's his job to come up with a vision. He'd go, right, we are going to, you know, invade Malta or something. Um or North Africa, and and Alan Brooke, the senior military advisor, would go, well, that's uh, okay, yep, but we can't do it with these resources. Or uh, how about we invade Cyprus instead? Uh, or uh, And then it, then Church will go up and go, well, Cyprus doesn't work, because here's what I'm trying to achieve, actually. You know, I'm trying to, like, scare the Germans or something, or the Italian. And then uh, Alan Brooke will come back and go, oh, I see, okay, so how about we do this? But therefore, I need these resources from over there. They can't go to, you know, Burma anymore. We've got to bring them back to the Med. And so you'd have this discourse at the strategic level between, as we all know, you know, ways, ends and means, what we're trying to achieve, how we're going to do it, and what resources we need. And that's informed, obviously, by a realistic picture of what's going on. And that discussion never really occurred in any of the nation's capitals but it certainly didn't occur in the in the in the british capital it wasn't successful because no matter how much information we generated that the war was not black white it was this soup that the system could imbibe that up to a point right mm. but it couldn't ab- imbibe it at the strategic level so it could just about take account of that at the tactical level. And so what that information did, it stopped us blundering around quite so much at the tactical level. And so there are definitely some Afghans and some Brits and some Americans that are alive today because of the work that we collectively, the political officers, cultural advisors did. And so, and that's that's cool. You know, that's definitely something that I can take away and, you know, we can all be proud of. Did it change the price of fish though? No, it didn't. It enabled us to gut the fish slightly differently, but the price of fish and what the fish was was exactly the same because that narrative was never going to penetrate London or Washington. And the reason it wasn't going to penetrate London or Washington was because if London or Washington accepted that we weren't involved in a black white, you know, government insurgency thing, actually it was a civil war of all these myriad of different conflicts and by being there, we were probably making it worse because we were just injecting resources into a conflict ecosystem that ended up fueling the conflict. Um, the automatic, as soon as London or Washington accepts that, the automatic thing you have to do is then leave, right? Because we, you know, we don't want to be making the situation worse. Purportedly, we were there to make the situation better. And so there was a kind of psychological self-protection i think amongst all sorts of people who were okay there was a huge amount of self-deception these incredibly clever people went there and completely ignored what was in front of their eyes because to accept it would kick out the psychological support for what they were doing you know we're all human i don't i'm not pointing fingers here i'm just fascinated that these are the dynamics that drive these things and drive countries to spend trillions of dollars um lose thousands of lives cause thousands of deaths Mm -hmm. and and it's actually these very basic human frailties and biases that cause these things to happen so i'm just wondering whether one way of sort of rephrasing this slightly is that we are looking at a conglomerate of different kind of competing narratives at the core of all this so mm. there's there are all the, the players on the ground who have been there, mm. the locals, they have their own narratives mm. Um, mm. that fuel their own conflicts. Then mm. you go in there with a, mm. with an official narrative. That mm. official narrative is part of a larger narrative that the, the politicians are trying to tell about how Britain is linked to America. So, I mean, the, mm. going into the war is part of a narrative that, that we're telling mm. about how we are good allies. And mm-hmm. then you are in there and, and your fellow advisors and you're trying to create a counter narrative about what's going on. And obviously these things sort of at some point, they, they get into conflict. 
yeah, may maybe then there's no direct resolution of this conflict of narratives. I mean, you could argue that that's what a conflict is, right? Perspectives that don't meet. Mm. I, I think that's exactly it. What I found interesting was that everybody described their conflict through their own worldview, right? So if you spoke to a tribal leader or a, a normal tribesman, right, they would describe the war as psha psha. And psha is a, in Pushtu is a leg, right? So they're literally saying it's a leg-leg conflict. Now, what that actually means is, um, in the same way that we might say the branch of a tribe, they say legs of different tribes. So they're, they're, the way they do the family tree in a tribe is by different legs. So when they're saying the war is psha psha, what they mean is it's a tribal war between different you know, genealogical groups, right? Clans and subclans. And I was like, okay. And then if you spoke to maybe someone who was in the Taliban movement or more ideological line, for them, it would be a religious war, right? They saw it in religious terms. That was their framing of it. And then if you spoke to, you know, a, a Westerner, a, a development expert or an army officer or whatever, you know, from America or the Dutch or something, they saw it as an ideological war. So this is about fundamentalism versus democracy. And so everyone came to the war and interpreted it through the way that they saw society. It, those three examples I gave you, the tribal leader, the, you know, the religious leader and the you know, Western development expert. What I find interesting is that each of those three people understood the war, interpreted the war through the societal framework with which the society that they were from or lived in interpreted the world. That was almost the level of societal development they got to. And therefore, that was how they understood the war. And yet they were all fighting the same war. But so that was really, you know, it took me a long time to realise that. And then that penny dropped and I was like, ah, this is how, I guess, conceptually, you bring together all of those different narratives into something that you can navigate. And I guess, you know, you said that cultural advisors we came in this different narrative, the political officers, we didn't. What we were trying to do was navigate that space in between all those narratives and try and get them to meet. Because if we could get them to meet, even just for a second, that meant that a military operation could pass off peacefully without having to fight its way in somewhere. There's so much to unpick in what you're saying here, Mike. It's there, there are lots and lots of questions. And at some point we will come on to your book, Why We Fight. But just to probe mm. your book, mm. An Intimate War, a little bit more and, and your experiences in Afghanistan. So, so, so you've, you've painted this really, really vivid picture of this kind of tangle of competing narratives, the challenge of getting people not necessarily to sign up to one narrative, but at least to recognize the multiple narratives, the multiple explanations and perspectives and so on. And that's what you as political advisors and, and cultural advisors were trying to do. But you also mentioned that one of the things that actually started to happen was that the Western narrative could be actually leveraged by, um, by people on the ground who didn't necessarily buy into it, um, but who thought, you know what, um, th this is a big narrative and we can use it or we, we, can, we can use it to bring more resources. Some of these sort of external um, outsider mm, narratives mm, actually mm. exacerbated, expanded the conflict. Can you go into that yeah. a little bit more? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, you, you know, I was saying all the Helmandis I met were unbelievable politicians. And to the, <laughs> to the extent that, you know, if a, a British officer would walk into the room and the assembled Helmandi tribal leaders or village heads or whatever would look at his face. And before he even said anything, they'd have worked out what his position was. Half the time they worked out what he was thinking and he hadn't even himself yet consciously come to that understanding. I mean, it was just amazing. And so in the same way that, you know, I understood that the war was ship shit, you know, it was a tribal war on their side. Um, Lots of Almandis who dealt with Westerners and who previously had dealt with the Russians, right, who also had a binary narrative, just a different one around revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries and all that stuff. Um, they would re they knew that we understood it as a government Taliban thing. So in order to curry favour with us, gain funding you know, get get a development projects in their area, get some arms for their militia, whatever, because they had their own local problems, right? They had the village across the way that they were having a fight over a water course about. They had that feud with the village sea over the way that, you know, because their grandfather killed their cousin or whatever. And so they needed weapons, right? And, and funding and all the rest of it and legitimacy to continue their fight. Like, no one likes to say, why are you fighting? I'm fighting because of drugs. <laughs> so everyone wants to have an overarching narrative, don't they, that they can fight for. 
so they would come in and they would frame this Pshe Pshe war in government Taliban terms. So they would come and say, yeah, Mike's up. So yeah, that village over there, they're all Talibs. And I go, okay. And they go, yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, tomorrow there's going to be like some bomb makers are going to be meeting there to build IEDs, you know, or there's a senior Taliban commander going there. His name is da 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 da. And I go, oh, okay, right. What he was really saying was, I've had a feud for 20 years with Muhammad in that village, and I'm just testing the water to see if you're stupid enough to go and believe me and knock him off. And so I'll spin some dit about him being in the Taliban or him being anti-government or whatever it kind of fits the current prevailing crow narratives around the government Taliban thing in that area. And p- potentially you'll go and sort him out. And you might not, but that's fine. In six months time, you'll change and we'll have another go with the next brigade that comes. So the Brits or other you know, outsiders were kind of seen as the most stupid yet most well-resourced tribe like they were up they were up to be manipulated and that was the main dynamic uh was manipulation really and they were trying to manipulate me i I was trying to manipulate them i mean let's not make any bones about it they were probably more successful than i was because essentially you know there are four things being traded in that kind of internationalized civil war you've got money legitimacy uh manpower and intelligence or information and those four things come together to create violence and there's a trade between insiders and outsiders outsiders tend to come with the money and they also come with a kind of framework that allows that money to be delivered so it's it's communism in the case of the russians or democracy and that you know, we can't just turn up and say we're funding a civil war. So there's some sort of legitimate narrative that the rest of the world maybe subscribes to that enables that funding to be delivered. Uh, you know, in the case of the other side, it was like Islam or, or jihadism, depending on you know which particular flavor they were. And on the other side is what the, the on the ground commanders bring. And they bring uh, manpower, obviously, you know, the, the people who are pulling the triggers and also um, kind of intelligence or information. They're the only people who know what's going on and they only know about 10% of what's going on right it's so complex that they don't have a clue either but they have much more of a clue than the outsiders do because the outsiders don't speak the language or whatever so of all those resources all are basically freely given apart from intelligence that's the most valuable resource in that environment and that puts the on the ground people at a huge advantage because they're the ones who have that information Um, And so they're much more able to manipulate outsiders than outsiders are to manipulate them. And so they would routinely dress up their shape, shape conflicts in a kind of Taliban government thing in the hope that we would take the bait and roll in and go and settle them. And they were doing the same to, to the, to the Taliban leadership in Quetta. They were doing the same to the Pakistanis. They did it to the Russians. They did it like every outsiders get manipulated in places like Afghanistan because it's so opaque and so complex that insiders don't have a hope of understanding everything. Outsiders, not a clue. Like, I, I, you know, I was speaking to um, this guy who I dealt with for years. And, and, and I said to him, well, we became friends, I suppose. And we were talking, we were just sort of reminiscing, I guess, looking back over the whole thing. And I said, so... Yeah, you know, the problem is, is a narrative we've gone through many times. You know, the Brits just don't have a clue what's going on. Probably about 1%. And he was like, oh, okay, okay. The Americans don't have a clue what's going on. And he sort of understood this by that point and accepted it. And he goes, no, but you understand a lot more. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you reckon? What do you reckon I understand? Uh, you know, and I'm sort of <laughs> puffing myself up here thinking, oh, maybe he'll say like, five percent or something i was like well great that's that's cool after eight years if i understand five percent of what's going on and he looked at me and went yeah i think brits in general understand zero percent and i think you understand about one percent and i was like oh so deflating after all that time there but it kind of encapsulated the, you know what we were involved in mm-hmm. Obviously, you you got very interested in trying to understand more. So while you were still serving in the army, you ended up starting to study for a PhD, looking really into the the, the, the much longer history of conflict in in Afghanistan, um, and that led you then to write the book An Intimate War, which then brought you into conflict with the army. Can you just talk our listeners through that? Uh, yeah, I mean, so they were very happy. Um, 
when I was the in, when I was an internal critic, uh, and they loved the PhD. You know, when I gave them the PhD afterwards, they loved that. Um, and then I, so I was a reservist, but I went full time for all my time when I was. So I spent six years full time, and then I went back to the reserves. And I, yeah, so I, I, I sort of published in the PhD. I rewrote the PhD, but then published it as a book called An Intimate War. And which describes, you know, everything we've been talking about. And then turns out the army at peace, because by that point we'd sort of drawn down from Afghanistan. The peacetime army is very different to the wartime army. And the wartime army is willing to put up with annoying junior officers who are going around uh, being critical, but delivering a bit of value. The peacetime army is not at all willing to do that. So they tried to try, they tried to ban it and they ordered me not to publish it and all this stuff. And then and I just thought, Pff. and so I resigned. I mean, I made it really clear to them that I, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to publish this book. So the question is, do you want to support the publication or do you want me to, you know, it's obviously going to become more of a media story. Like you paid for the book, you paid for the PhD, right? You know, when it came, <laughs> the front page of the Times, Army tries to ban its own book, was the headline for 2014. And you just couldn't get more stupid. And you know, in a way, it's just a sort of microcosm of the stupidity with which the Ministry of Defence handled the whole war. And they've got form on this as well. There's like several books that they've tried to ban, failed, merely increased the sales of the book. And, you know, it was very good. So the charities, that, that you know, the, the, all the proceeds from that book are going to charity. And so they just got more money, which is great. <laughs> It strikes me as one of those that has been tried before types of approaches, right? Where people try to suppress those uh, those narratives they don't like, and in uh. the end, uh, all that achieves is that you know even more people get exposed to that narrative. So it's kind of surprising that they would go for this not uh. not very kind of promising tactic. You know, I mean, it's ironic though, in a somewhat tragic way, in that the whole argument of the book is we mm. need to understand better the yes. narratives that explain yes. this whole conflict, the historic narratives, and also these fictional, these idealizing, these romanticizing, these political narratives. We need yep. to understand them. And so, you know, mm. suppressing the book and not wanting to read, not wanting other people to read, not wanting to understand that, not wanting to engage with this complexity, yeah. as yeah. you say, is it, it sort of captures, I suppose, what, what you were saying was at the, you know, at the heart of the, the problem during conflict. It was deeply ironic. My PhD was paid for out of the budget set aside to learn lessons from Afghanistan. <laughs> and, but when, when they'd learnt those lessons, uh, they decided that they didn't like them and then tried to suppress them. And, you know, this is kind of typical of na national security institutions. They love to hide behind. They love to say, no, no, we'll do our review, but we'll do it internally so we can choose which lessons to learn. But that's not how it works. As we know, sunlight is antiseptic. And the only way that organizations uh, are held to account is you have people checking on people who are checking on other people who are checking on other people. And of course, Mike, you're continuing your very good work in terms of exposing gaps between narrative and reality by actually teaching now on some military training courses, which train cultural advisors for the British Army for other armed forces as well. Uh, mm. So so you're 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 continuing mm. that. This cultural advisor program, I mean, that, that is a positive outcome out of your your time in, in Afghanistan. And that, that is something that's maybe a bit of a legacy that, that's become part of the institution that, if continued, will make a difference or is already making a difference. I think militaries have a tendency to uh, salami slice capabilities in order to save money because, you know, we just had the integrated review, right? So they've said we need to do a lot more cyber information space you know ai and robotics i don't think anyone did, would deny that we need to do more in that space the question is how do you fund that do you fund that through cutting previous capabilities or do you say actually we need a bit more money um so as we've seen they've decided to cut the army by ten thousand people right is that a good idea probably not um And so I think that the same thing, you know, you look at uh, DCSU and cultural advisors and stuff like that. Well, you know, that's going to work. The sine qua non of that working is fluent linguists. Okay, that's the whole point of that job is linguists who understand the language because language is a key to another society. Like it's anyone who's bilingual will understand that 
if you speak another language, you have a key that opens up another society to you. Okay, you simply cannot get into that society speaking, not speaking the language in a way that you would if you can speak the language. There's an indisputable fact. Yet, you know, the problem is most policymakers don't speak two languages in the UK. Right. And so we're very poor at foreign languages. So are the Americans, because everyone, you know, the global language is English. So we're incredibly lazy. And that means we've got we've got monolingual people making policy decisions. And so they don't see the importance of, oh, they see language and they see, right, well, there's 18 months that I can cut out of someone's career path that costs a fortune. Uh, so that's great. That'll go. When you look at the stupendous sums spent on hardware in the military, and I've, again, got no problem with that. I think you need to spend stupendous sums on that. To put somewhat, I, I, I worked out that to put me through my language training uh, then cost the same as about four javelin missiles. Now, is a linguist uh, over the course of their career going to stop the military firing four of those missiles or equivalent, right? You get the idea. It's an argument. Yes, is, is the answer. So that's the kind of trade-off that you're looking at. So, Mike, you studied, you've looked at, analysed war conflict through your experience of being in Afghanistan, also through history. But but you were also, you studied biology as an undergraduate. Mm, and did, in yeah. Why We Fight, you've turned mm. to biology and psychology up to a point rather than mm. social or political science to yeah. explain what drives humans to fight. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that. How does biology help us understand why we fight? How does that help us understand conflict? Um, so, I mean, the short answer is that humans are animals <laughs> and we're part of the animal kingdom and therefore the rules of evolution apply to us. That is an obvious statement as soon as I say it, but actually it's not really an assumption that most people work with. I think if you look at a lot of political science or conflict science, there's a sort of rational actor model that permeates it that humans are rational and act through a kind of logical framework of understanding that goes back to that chess point you made at the start when you were talking about yeah. the stories you'd grown up with where absolutely you, you know this impression was that uh, it was strategy it was ruses it was out thinking it it was all yeah you know a yeah. game of chess yeah 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 absolutely and and that's why all wars in a sense all wars ha have the same uh, nature. Well, this was the Clausewitzian point, right? The essence of war is unchanging. And what he meant by that was, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a, 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 a phalanx of hoplites or whether it's a cruise missile attack on a desert training camp. The essence of war is the same. It's a psychological battle between two evolved brains that are trying to outflank each other there's a hubris there's you know defeat attack retreat advance ruse deception all, all of these things it's the same and this is why modern military personnel study ancient battles and go on battlefield tours because it doesn't matter really what the weapon systems are or the technology levels the human brain is the same and the technology is just the tools in order to achieve those outcomes. So, you know, you always see it's just a perennial like in the newspapers. Oh, war's changing. Actually, it's not. We're just getting some new toys. But actually, the essence of war is exactly the same. And the reason it's exactly the same is because of this point that humans are animals and we've evolved and we've got two evolved brains trying to outcompete each other. That's basically the essence of strategy. It's the essence of war. It's the essence of politics. Right. They're all the same thing. I was amazed that more people hadn't um, tried to uh, apply psychology and biology and evolution to war. Like war is a totally ubiquitous human behavior. It's as human as making war is as human as making love and or laughing. Um, it, it's this idea of gathering together with a group of people and fighting another group of people who gathered together is permeates all societies for all time. It's just a question of scale. There's a central question that you have to answer, which is evolution is about survival and reproduction, and it's based on individuals surviving and reproducing. So why do people go to war and die for their groups? <laughs> and that is a central question that you have to answer and to contextualize it for your listeners. First World War, really interesting example. The French lost about 30% of the males 
in the fighting cohort. So let's say that that's like 17 to 35, 30%. I mean, that is stupendous. And in what we call that in biology is a negative selection pressure. And, you know, wars throughout history have had these very high death rates. Before penicillin and other medical advances, most people died of disease or, you know, they get a cut and they would get infected gangrene and die, you know. So the death rate from war has always been huge. So the question is not only why do we do it, but often why is there such enthusiasm to go to war? And, you know, right through, you know, Alice, I know you're an expert on the classical era. And from that era right through to now, often when we reflect on wars afterwards, we say, oh, it was terrible. But before them, we always say they're amazing. We've got to go for it. Right. Let's go, guys. Come on. And that is and that that occurs so much in the historical records that it's something that you have to contend with. You can't just say, oh, they were just, you know, framing it that way or whatever. Like, no, it is a genuine feeling that societies often have before they go to war. And so you, you have to answer this question, not only why people fight wars but often why they're driven to fight wars when there is this huge negative selection pressure you'd think that those desires to fight would have been selected out because humans are part of the animal kingdom the laws of evolution apply Mm -hmm. i mean i i I totally get this idea that there's something very kind of spontaneous intuitive behind all of this i mean the the things that we experience in daily life when something gets you very angry (laughs) you know you sometimes you have to work very hard to sort of uh, suppress an outburst um but i keep thinking about the role of narratives and i'm just wondering whether narratives become increasingly important actually in in negotiating these outbursts in a way that if, if you were fighting for your community in a small community and obviously there's an immediate link between you going to war and the suffering that you've experienced but modern wars are often a lot more complex where you wonder why should an american or a british soldier go to afghanistan is this is this really about survival as such mm. there that's where mm. the narrative comes in and where people kind of subscribe to narratives that makes it seem like yes this is about survival or it's, it is about kind of the essentials of life uh, even though the people we're fighting mm. are thousands of miles away from where we are are those narratives do they motivate people to fight or do they merely justify an already made emotional decision to want to fight and i guess this gets to the heart of your project and i think that There's a lot of evidence in psychology that humans make emotional, subconscious emotional decisions, and then they later justify those decisions consciously. Um, And this is this is well respected science. This is not like a fringe view. You know, this is Mm -hmm. um, but this idea that the reasons that people give for doing things are not the reasons that they do things. That is a kind of central tenet in psychology these days and and that's you know pretty well respected and so the question is when people go to war and they say yeah i'm going for you know all the reasons that nicholas you've just articulated really well is that actually why they're doing it or is that just a socially acceptable narrative for the fact that they want to go and get involved in a war and i you know i come back to my own experiences of going to war when I said I always wanted to soldier as a kid, what I meant was I wanted to go into combat. That's what I meant. And there's a societal narrative around, oh, you know, soldiers are either victims or heroes, right? They're either jumping on a grenade and saving their mates or they're like victims sent to these poor, terrible wars. Or isn't it terrible? That, you know, doesn't, doesn't help soldiers. Let's put that to one side for the moment. That's a conversation for another day. But nowhere is this narrative in public view that soldiers actually quite enjoy fighting. They want to fight. And, and and that's not to say that it's not at times terrifying and you know terrible and all this kind of stuff. But actually, the predominant narrative going to war is of soldiers who are like really want to get into their first contact. You know, there, there's a there's an a, 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 a almost childlike enthusiasm to getting stuck in and proving yourself. And you want to know how you're going to do when the rounds start flying. And um, that you know and that you know you, your first contact or the first 20 or whatever it gets a bit boring after that but maybe if you know you're sort of really excited and almost zen like in the kind of pure uh like you're being flooded with like hormones that make you feel 
uh, Zen like. And um, I, I find it curious that, and don't forget this starts well before you get into danger. So why is it that your body is flooding you with positive hormones, pushing you to do something? Um, and I think, so there's two things going on. I think your subconscious is pushing you. You've got these drives that are pushing you to do stuff. And then people go, why do you want to go to war? And that's a bit difficult to explain. <laughs> and so you go, well, you know, it's, I think it's about, you know, democracy and the, whatever the framework is that you've got. That, and then they go, oh, yeah, because that's something that they can understand. You know, it's a societally acceptable framework for your own raw emotions. And if you think about it, that's what society is. Society is about coming up with narratives that we can mostly accept in order to situate our own personal drives that we may or may not be aware of consciously into these things that work called societies. As you said, Mike, this, this question of what drives us, what drives our enthusiasm, what drives the soldier who actually sort of wants to experience the rush of being, you know, being actually in a combat situation really does go to the heart of our project because it is it kind of goes to that question about the feedback loop between narrative and reality. So, you know, you, in Why We Fight, you make a very strong case for really exploring even more the evolutionary basis, the biological basis, the, the yeah. involvement of hormones, the involvement of our subconscious, which then we explain with more socially justifiable narratives. Yeah, but it's yeah. also potentially the case that that soldier who wants a rush is part also influenced by the childhood tales by the films by yeah, right. the fact yeah. that that when sure. you go to a big blockbuster movie what do you see you don't see someone yeah. sitting around drinking cups of tea talking to people in Pashtu you see the contact and you you mm. uh, you kind of vicariously experience that rush in the cinema mm. I suppose yeah, yeah. so yep. narrative yeah, yeah. and hormones kind of play off each other play play mm. against each other mm. Mm. and I suppose yeah. that brings me to a, a kind of follow on question. So in why we fight, well, so all the way through, you're interested in the fact that one reason why we fight is this sort of um, a very basic need to belong. So mm -hmm. that's that's part of our subconscious. It's this yeah. um, it's this yeah. evolutionary bias. So that's, you know, that's one of the things mm -hmm. that drives us. But you, you then talk about the fact that, um, you know, if we want to reduce conflict, what we need to mm. do actually is foster social narratives that reinforce positive mm senses mm. of belonging yeah. not what we mm. see happening in politics right now of course no. we you know we're, we're no. othering people we're othering migrants we're singling out different ethnic and religious mm. groups and yeah. that's one of the things that's been going on in these black and white narratives about the yeah. conflict in Afghanistan and so on you seem to be arguing towards the end of why we fight that actually maybe narratives of belonging perhaps also narratives about conflict might have a role to play in, in reducing conflict, not just in justifying and and explaining, and perhaps as we talked about in the context of Afghanistan, sometimes exacerbating conflict. Before I come on to that, there's the sort of the point you made previously about, uh, you know, there's a balance between the hormones shaping the narrative or narrative shaping the hormones. I, I think that's absolutely right. Really, we're at the first stage of this sort of research process, right? There's a predominant narrative and Mike, me, a, a contrarian by nature, has set up a counter narrative, right? So obviously that counter narrative is probably going to overshoot the mark and there's going to be somewhere that we're going to meet. And of course, the question is, where does the where does the exact locus of agency lie between subconscious and conscious and, or hormones and, and narrative? And I think that's really interesting. And we need to do a huge amount of work to understand exactly where there is. And we'll probably never really define it because it's the way the brain works, if you think about it, it rewires itself all the time. So what I'm saying at the moment is there's a whole bit of this we've missed out that we need to kind of bring together. Yeah, I mean, I guess in a sense, it's these sort of broad social narratives. It's nothing new in a sense, right? This is what successful politicians do is they build big tents that are able to bring together different narratives and they're or they're able to come up with meta narratives that allow individual narratives to agglomerate into a meta narrative right and so so in that sense what i'm suggesting is nothing new i guess i was just coming at it from the point of view of saying hang on guys but there's actually quite a lot of science that demonstrates why we should do that you know so i guess it's an argument for liberal with a small l politics um but with a bunch of science underlying it to say here's the other side of the fence if you don't do that this is what it looks like um and i think it has you, know, you talk about othering 
it, it, it will work on a grand scale of conflict resolution, but it also works on a small scale around terrorism and stuff. I think some of our kind of counterterrorism policies are pretty rubbish and don't really take into account what we now understand about how people belong to groups, why they belong to groups, what the hormonal underlay of them belonging to groups is. And um, so I think we could bring a lot of that stuff into how we govern. Look, I think, you know, at heart, I'm a scientist. I think we could bring a lot more science into how we govern. I think if you look at the, you know, in the UK, if you look at the cabinet, it's it's not many scientists, but I just think a bit more balance um, in the in the cabinet would be useful. On a small scale, that's how we can bring more politics in. But actually on a larger scale, thinking about how we design our political systems, I think there's a lot that we can take into account about what we understand about how and why people belong and how and why people uh, differentiate themselves from other groups and how identity, the, the physiological basis, the psychological basis to group identity. And that could, you know, we've got all sorts of problems like, you know, micro identity politics and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, the culture war, quote unquote, and all these things sort of speak to the same or, or rather this idea of understanding how we belong speaks to all of those ideas. So, Mike, it has been really fascinating talking yes. to you. We've talked you about um, yeah. meta narratives, macro narratives, micro narratives, the tangle of narratives that micro identities, micro identities. Mm. And you have absolutely convinced me that we need more evolutionary biology in our <laughs> research <good. laughs> project. We, we already have a psychology um, one classicist, element. one yeah. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is, you know, this is the way forward. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, Mike, you've given us and our listeners a huge amount to think about. If anyone wants to dive deeper into Mike's work, which I strongly recommend, you can buy both An Intimate War and Why We Fight. And in fact, there's actually a discount code for Why We Fight at the moment. If you go through Hearst Publishers, so that's hearstpublishers.com, Why We Fight, and the checkout code for the discount is WARFIGHT25, all in capital letters for a 25% discount. But also check out Mike's website, www.threshedthought.com. And you can find a range of articles and talks there, as well as more information about his publications. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for joining us on the show tonight. And uh, thank you, thank you uh, to our listeners also for joining us again. And um, we hope you have enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Mike Martin as much as we have. Do keep tuning in to the Visualizing World podcast. And next time, we will be talking with Rosie Kay, founder of the Rosie Kay Dance Company. She spent time with the 4th Battalion, the Rifles, and also did a lot of research with the Armed Forces Rehabilitation Center to help her develop an award-winning show called Five Soldiers, which explores the physical experience of being a soldier. So we will be moving from how we imagine and describe wars on the international stage and through the human mind to looking at how war gets visualized through the human body. If you would like to support our project, please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud and Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. If you want to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media. Just search for Visualising War or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at standrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young and the show was mixed by Zofia Gertin. Thank you very much for listening.